No matter how safe you think you are, evil doesn't need an invitation to come through your door. Carla McPhee is a single mom, trying to make a better life for her and her daughter, Caitlin. But one Sunday afternoon, Carla's mother returns with Caitlin after babysitting her for the weekend. They have climbed these steps a hundred times, running to Carla's welcoming arms. They have no idea what horror waits for them inside. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free, no subscription required. Download Veely now. Toronto, 1994. Detective Doug Grady of the Toronto Homicide Squad responds to the discovery of Carla McPhee's body. Grady sees immediately that Carla has been sexually assaulted. Her posterior was up in the air slightly and her head was almost decapitated with several cuts across the throat with a very, very sharp instrument. Grady notices something unusual about the pattern of blood around Carla's body. The pooling of blood was straight underneath her, um, her throat. There was not um, cast off blood in directions around the apartment. There wasn't anything on the walls uh, that you'd normally get when somebody who's got a frenzy with a, a knife. So it looked like uh, she was probably pushed down from behind and somebody who was very strong or in real control of the victim did this offense. This can only mean one of two things. Either the victim in this case knew the attacker because nothing was ransacked, nothing seemed to be unusual in the apartment, or she was totally surprised by the attacker. The coroner arrives to examine Carla's body. He discovers that she has been anally raped and collects a semen sample for DNA analysis. Grady needs to have a quiet word with Carla's mother. How could she have made herself vulnerable to such a violent attack? Where was she? What was she doing? Who was she with in the few hours before her death? We interviewed the mother. Uh, the mother had uh, picked up the child uh, early Friday to have her for the weekend so that the victim in this matter could have a weekend by herself. Carla's mother, Dora, describes her as a loving and devoted mom. She worked and studied hard, dreaming of the day when her certificate as a legal secretary would allow her to build a better life for herself and Caitlin. She says until four years ago, Carla was happy planning her upcoming marriage. But her life was torn apart when her fiance suddenly died. Unable to cope with the devastating loss, Carla plunged into a spiral of depression that led to a dependency on painkillers and finally alcohol. Most of the time, Carla could keep her demons at bay. But when she felt the pressures building to a breaking point, she'd send Caitlin to stay with her grandmother just for the weekend so her daughter wouldn't see her out of control. And this had been one of those weekends. As Grady replaces the photo of Carla's dead fiance, he makes a discovery. On the mirror in the bedroom, there was a note, and it was a note from somebody who was quite upset. Carla, I left at 1.30 a.m. What happened? Did the beer delivery man have a cure-all drug for you to make you well? 
going out with him and leaving me here is a total insult upon me. Think about what you did and how rude your actions were. Call me when the milkman leaves. The handwritten note is signed by someone named Frankie. Who is he? Dora is instantly hostile. Frankie is Carla's current boyfriend who lives nearby. Carla was trying to break free of him. Frankie is brought down to the police station for questioning. He hobbles in on the crutches he needs for his bad hip. Grady wants to know about the note, its jealous tone. Who is the beer delivery man, this milkman, who made Frankie so upset? But Frankie is distracted and often incoherent. This particular person had his own physical problems. He had his own uh, dependencies. He had uh, some drug abuse himself, and he was a recovering addict. What does come out is that Frankie went to see Carla on Friday night. According to him, she had already started her weekend binge. She was drunk and out of control. She was furious that Frankie had not brought any beer with him, so she called her local beer delivery man, the milkman in Frankie's note. Carla sent him off to put the beer in the fridge. She must have left with the guy, Frankie tells Grady. All he knows is that when he came out of the kitchen, she was gone. He was so angry that he took her keys and went home, leaving her locked out of the apartment. 125, 123. About 2.30 Saturday morning, at home in his own bed, he got a call from Carla. She was screaming at him for locking her out. He didn't want to listen to any more abuse. He hung up on her. There's only one person who can back Frankie's story. It doesn't take Grady long to find the man who makes his living as a late-night booze courier. The delivery man admits he brought beer to Carla's apartment that night. He'd done it often before. Sure, Frankie was there. But as soon as he was out of the way, Carla started flirting. She asked him to take her out for a drink. She was an attractive young woman, so he decided that when she asked him to take her to a, a local bar, that he thought, fine, he would do that. Carla didn't show him the good time he was looking for. And then she just left him basically at the, um, at the bar as, she, as he walked in. Grady now has two suspects, two men made to look like fools. But was this enough to make either one of them commit such a horrendous rape and murder? Or was Carla's murderer lurking in the bar that night? waiting to buy her one last drink. Detective Grady needs to trace Carla's movements the night she was murdered. He canvasses her building. Did anyone see her with Frankie? Who helped her make the phone call? Grady has success with two young women who live in a basement apartment. They did see Carla late that night, and they do have a story to tell. When the victim came back, she couldn't get into her apartment, so she was banging on doors to be let in. Finally, she knocks on the door of a couple of students. She had to call her ex, and she used this phone of the, the students. Well, they heard from her yelling and screaming and demeaning this person. She's very upset, very irate, because she always left the, the apartment unlocked. The students wanted to get rid of Carla before she woke the whole building. So one of the girls went to get the super to let her into her apartment. They watched her go in, and that was the last time they saw her. 
Since he had a key to her apartment, the super is next on Grady's list. But he tells the same story as the students. He let her in and went back to bed. End of story. After speaking to the students and the super, Grady is now convinced that Frankie is his prime suspect. He had uh, a motive. He had the opportunity. The one thing we didn't know about him of whether he had the means and the strength. Could a man on crutches overpower Carla? Grady brings Frankie back to the station to fill out a questionnaire asking him, where were you that night? How did you know the victim? What more can you tell us? One of the questions is, did you kill this victim? He responded to that by writing, I don't know. That was the, the second day of our investigation. If I ask somebody, did you do a crime? I expect the answer to be no, I did not or to be upset that I'm asking the question. Grady immediately digs deeper into Frankie and Carla's past. He finds police reports of abuse on both sides. Get out! So this was a truly a volatile relationship that was uh, uh, ongoing and had been going on for about four or five years. Grady grills Frankie about his answer, I don't know, to the questionnaire. After several hours, it's clear Frankie has no answer. Under pressure to prove his innocence, Frankie agrees to give a blood sample to compare his DNA with the attacker's semen recovered from Carla's body. The results are a stunning surprise. DNA returns show that the semen in Carla's body did not come from Frankie. But even though Frankie's DNA isn't a match, Grady is sure Frankie is somehow involved in Carla's murder. Why else would he answer, I don't know? Frankie's alibi is checked by other means. Grady subjects him to a polygraph test. Finally, persistence pays off. The polygraph reveals Frankie is lying. But about what exactly? Well, when his DNA doesn't match and he fails a polygraph, that may mean that we have taken the wrong direction. Maybe he's not the person that uh, committed this homicide. Perhaps it's a friend of his. Perhaps uh, he, there's something he's trying to hide. Grady puts Frankie under surveillance. For me as an investigator, I want to find out who did this, who's responsible, because I'm also concerned that it was such a violent homicide. I'm concerned that this is not going to be the last one for this particular perpetrator. With no solid evidence to connect Frankie to the murder, Grady casts his net wider, looking for other links to the killing. He collects DNA samples from people that he knows had contact with Carla, the building superintendent, the beer delivery man, men from the bar, and Frankie's drug dealer. But no one is a match for the rapist's DNA. It becomes more and more frustrating that we're not speaking to anybody who's been the donor of the DNA deposit in the victim. After six months, the investigation grinds to a halt. There are no new leads, no new suspects, and there has been no DNA hit. Carla's killer is still at large. The case goes cold for three years, when suddenly, out of nowhere, comes a break that Grady could never have imagined. Finally, Detective Doug Grady gets a break in a case that has haunted him for three years. In a seemingly unrelated crime, a sexual predator has brutally raped two little girls. Fortunately, there was a witness and the rapist was caught. His semen is submitted for analysis to the Center of Forensic Sciences. His DNA is a match for a sample taken from an earlier crime. Scientists call such an unexpected match a cold hit. 
Pamela Newell analyzed the results. The results came back to me, uh, and I'm told that there is a, a hit to spermatozoa from the rectal swab of a young mother who's been raped and murdered in Toronto some years prior to this. That young mother was Carla McPhee. The degree of certainty in that particular case is that you would not expect to see it again in six billion people in the entire population of the world. To Detective Grady, Pamela Newell's cold hit means that Carla's murderer and the child rapist have to be the same person, Anthony Melbourne Lee. And that's the frustrating part in, in the case, to know that there may have been a way, I don't know what the way is, but there may have been something there that should have caused us to get towards Melbourne Lee uh, before he was able to victimize other people. With Lee as his new prime suspect, Grady can finally let go of his suspicions about Frankie. He now understands Frankie's answer to the question, did you kill Carla? I don't know. I now believe the reason he said that is because he truly didn't know what happened and if he was the one responsible. I believe that he was intoxicated quite often during this period of time and that he was so upset with her, he didn't know if he actually did it or not. Grady starts to build the case against Anthony Melbourne Lee, a career criminal with a long history of violent crimes against women and children. He is diagnosed as a sadistic rapist as well as a psychopath. He scores 39 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist, making him one of the most dangerous people in the country. We start looking at our, at, at our suspect now and seeing where we can intertwine him with the victim. Grady looks into the files on Anthony Lee and discovers that three years ago, Lee had a temporary address in Toronto. That address is another apartment in Carla McPhee's building. With that knowledge, I went and interviewed him at the uh, facility that he was in custody on, on these original charges of uh, sexually assaulting two young girls. And during that interview, he could have cared less about anything. Lee doesn't try to hide the fact that he was staying with a friend in Carla's building about that time. He often stayed there. Grady digs deeper. How does Lee explain that his semen was found in Carla's body? Lee has a quick answer for that. He remembers Carla quite well. He'd been out front having a smoke when she came staggering home, drunk out of her mind. She liked his smile and invited him up for a drink. Lee was discreet. He says he watched the whole scene go down with Carla being locked out. He waited until the coast was clear before grabbing some drinks and heading upstairs where Carla was waiting. Hey, baby. You there? Lee remembers that after a few drinks, Carla got kinky. She wanted to have anal sex on the love seat. Everything was going great when her boyfriend suddenly showed up. But Lee was cool. He'd been in this situation before and knew better than to ever take his pants off. He jumped up, pulled out the pistol he kept tucked under his waistband, grabbed the drinks and split while Frankie went crazy in the apartment. Lee took off for Detroit and never looked back. But Carla was alive when he left her. Grady has to consider the possibility that Lee is telling the truth. As much as it was our opinion that the person that did this sexual assault is the suspect, you have to prove it to a jury way beyond just the DNA being there and therefore it's him. We had to show that he had the, the motive, the, uh, the deviancy to do this. He had the opportunity. He was there, able to do it. To help him establish the case against Lee, Grady turns to prosecutor Rita Zayed. Together, the two dismantle Lee's story point by point. Mr. Lee gave a story, but the crime scene photographs really contradicted him. Grady and Zayed examine the photographs. 
they clearly show the cushions neat and undisturbed. No one had sex on the love seat. Grady and Zayed consider how ridiculous Lee's claim is that when confronted by Frankie and holding him at gunpoint, he would bother to stop for the drinks. They analyze and reanalyze Lee's story. They focus on the biggest hole of all and demolish Lee's story with the simple observation that Lee never mentioned, but surely would have seen had Frankie really confronted him that night. The man was on crutches. In court, Grady and Zayed present their theory of what really must have happened to Carla that night. The victim came into her apartment, did not lock the door, She goes to that armchair. She puts on her favorite movie. She's sitting there with her drink, having a cigarette. The suspect, Mr. Lee, walks in, puts a knife to her throat because there is no sign of struggle, forces her on the floor. She is anally raped. And of course, she's almost decapitated. He knew it was wrong to rape women and children. He knew it was wrong to kill someone, but he didn't care. He didn't care. They very rarely think of a homicide case where there's redeeming things in it, where, thank God, something happened. Perhaps the only thing in this case is finally Melbourne Lee is off the streets and that he's not going to be able to do this to somebody else. The court found Anthony Melbourne Lee guilty of first-degree murder and declared him a dangerous offender. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Playing with a human life is the most cruel game of all. Life is always a gamble, especially for newcomers to a country. And wealth doesn't always protect you. In fact, it can put you at a much greater risk. Because no matter where you go, the old country is never far behind. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Vancouver, British Columbia, 1998. Detective Gordon Black is quickly setting up a special operations team to investigate the brutal kidnapping of Selena Fong, a young Asian woman, 18 years old. When myself and the others were brought in to this investigation, it was some six and a half hours after the actual crime had taken place. Detective Black has no clue why the family has waited this long to call the police. He has sent two undercover officers to the Fong's house. Stu McDonald will be his eyes and ears, backed up by translator Alan Lai. Selena's mother, Miki Fong, barely speaks English, so she tells her story in Cantonese. She says it all started innocently when someone rang the bell. A delivery man was at the door with a gift for Selena, but the man and two others forced their way into the house. She was quite frightened at that time, and, uh, and she froze, basically. They, uh, they physically took her upstairs to the bedroom where they 
bound her and, and uh, removed her clothing. Mrs. Fong says that the men started to take compromising pictures, threatening to broadcast the video on the internet if she didn't obey their orders. Shortly after four o'clock, she heard Selena coming home from school. The kidnappers were waiting for her. She was wrestled to the ground, her eyes were covered, she was threatened, she was struck, uh, she was placed in just a position of abject terror. Both the mother and the daughter were trying to calm each other while these men were trying to subdue the victim. The kidnappers made their demands clear. They wanted half a million dollars in ransom. And no contact with police, otherwise Selena would be killed. Throughout her ordeal, Mrs. Fong was struck by one fact. These individuals uh, spoke perfect Cantonese dialect. Her thoughts were immediately cast to the fact that these people were from her native country of Hong Kong, which heightened her level of fear. In Hong Kong and China, kidnapping for ransom has been a common crime for centuries. The kidnappers are often professionals. Abductions are seldom reported. Mrs. Fong says that when she managed to free herself, she immediately phoned her husband, who was in Hong Kong on business. She told him of the kidnappers' demands. Her husband was at a loss. In Hong Kong, he would know how to proceed. The rules of the game are simple. Kidnap, contact, pay. But in Canada, the rules may be different. So he told her to call Vancouver police while he caught the next flight home. Alan Lai was born in China. He knows that getting the Fongs to trust the police will not be easy. Gaining her confidence was the most important thing for, for us as the police to do. Uh, we needed to reassure her that everything that was discussed was going to be uh, dealt with in confidentiality and the fact that we will do everything we can to help uh, save her daughter. While police wait for the kidnappers to establish contact, Detective Black and his tactical team make their first move. Set up undercover surveillance of the Fong house. He also starts to follow his only lead in the case, the victim and her family. Why would this particular family be selected in what is a normally very peaceful community, a community that's devoid of violence or threats like this? So we expanded our inquiries to cover Hong Kong, the father, his business dealings. Detective Black learns that David Fong is a very successful businessman. As is often the case in Hong Kong, he sometimes conducts business over the gambling table. His business ventures give him the ability to acquire substantial amounts of cash very quickly. The kidnappers have done their homework. It takes David Fong over 24 hours to arrive back in Vancouver. He already has part of the kidnappers ransom, over a hundred grand in cash. He will be the one dealing directly with the kidnappers when they make contact. That night, Detective Black sneaks into the Fong's house and has his first meeting with David Fong. Fong must be won over to their strategy. The first phone call with the kidnappers will set the tone for the whole negotiation. We needed to alert him to what he might face on the telephone and why certain things should and shouldn't be said. Basically, what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, and what we expect will happen. This goes against David Fong's plan to pay the ransom and get his daughter back as soon as possible. But Detective Black warns him, Selena is likely to be killed if he does this. Nearly three days have gone by since Selena's abduction, and still no word from the kidnappers. For the Fongs, seconds pass like hours.
first phone call came in and uh, the father picked up the phone. Uh, he was uh, quite upset, uh, very distraught. The uh, only thing he was worried about was the safe recovery of his daughter. They patched Black's headquarters into the Fong's house. The call came from a male and it was evident right away that the voice was disguised through some electronic mechanism. They were very direct. They weren't prepared for to negotiate with the father. It was one-sided, basically telling him, this is how things are going to be from here on in. The kidnappers are dictating the terms. Either David pays the half million dollars immediately, or Selena dies. Minutes after the first phone call, Selena Fong's kidnappers call again. Detective Black has carefully coached David Fong on what to say. I'd asked him at one point to be hysterical. I needed real tears from him. I needed a man sobbing uh, at, at the, you know, at the potential harm to his daughter. And I didn't needed him to give virtually an Academy Award performance. He pleads for his daughter's life, begs to talk to her. The kidnappers have no idea that his tears are only to convince them he will play by their rules. But the kidnappers ignore David's plea. They don't let him talk to Selena. <laughs> Selena's parents and the police have no idea of the ordeal she is going through but they are well aware of what kidnappers do to young women. Detective Black and his team have tried to trace the two calls, but the kidnappers are pros. They keep the calls too short for police to pin down their location. In addition to monitoring the calls, Surveillance maintains a web of undercover officers surrounding the Fong's house. There were those that were in the observation posts around the house. There was another ring of surveillance in vehicles. And then there was teams of surveillance units that had the ability to follow somebody away from the house should a vehicle or a person show up. But surveillance reports nothing out of the ordinary. Later that day, a third call comes in. The kidnappers give David Fong his instructions. Be ready to pay the ransom any time in the next 48 hours. They were very assertive that he leave his home on short notice, that he take large sums of money to a specific location, drop it off and leave, and his daughter would be sent home at a later date. With each call and each passing hour, David is more and more tempted to revert to his way of solving the crisis. He's raised additional cash. He now has the half million dollars and is ready to trade for his daughter. Detective Black needs to keep him on track. That means stall the ransom payment and keep negotiating until he can take control of the situation. You can sum it up as a big waiting game. What is going to be their next move and have we possibly thought of every scenario we can in order to be prepared to respond? Four days after the abduction, the kidnappers call in the dead of night. They want to set up the ransom drop-off for the next day. But reluctantly, David follows Detective Black's tactics. He won't pay, he says, until he talks to his daughter. The tactics work. And she stated she was OK. They were treating her OK just to pay the money and don't call the police. And uh, it seemed like a very scripted uh, conversation. David tells her to be strong, to hold on. Yeah. 
Hearing Selena's voice is a great relief for David Fong. But more than ever, he wants to forget about the whole police strategy. Moments later, the kidnappers call back. Now that they've given David Fong proof Selena is alive, they want the money. For David, it's the moment of truth. Deal with the criminals in his own way, or play it out the way police have advised. He decides to stick with Black's plan. Pleadingly, he tells the kidnappers he cannot come up with the whole ransom. The kidnappers' rage gives David Fong a moment of complete despair. What if this charade means death for his daughter? The demands that we put on the father throughout the negotiation process were really uh, something that no human being would like to face. An hour, then two. The kidnappers have agreed to lower the ransom by $100,000. Detective Black has just won another round. But that same night, unbeknownst to police, the kidnappers are calling a vote. Once they collect the ransom, does Selena live or die? It doesn't take them long to agree. Death to Selena. Detective Black is preparing for what he senses is the final round with the kidnappers. But for this crucial showdown, he needs to coach David Fong face to face. The key to keeping his daughter alive will depend on how well David plays his hand. The strategy is this. On the next call, David must refuse to pay the ransom unless Selena is brought to the drop-off and is exchanged on the spot for the money. And if the kidnappers don't give in, then he must threaten to pull out. We told him, we're going to ask you to do this today. And when you do that, they're going to say it's all over. They're not going to deal with you anymore. And when they do that, they're going to phone you back within uh, a very short time and start again as if it never happened. When the next phone call comes in, a surveillance team spots a blue car, driven by an Asian man talking on a cell phone. They put a surveillance detail on him. Later that day, police watched the blue car pull up to a green car parked on a street. The driver of the blue car switches with the other driver, who is also Asian. Then they both drive off. Both cars are followed. Les Flewelling, who's in charge of surveillance, keeps on the trail of the first man they spotted. The man drives straight to a deserted parking lot. He makes one quick stop and takes off. When it appeared to be safe enough to have an officer go over and, and look in the dumpster, one of the officers made his way over, pulled the uh, package out that this guy had dumped in, took a look inside, and a number of the uh, victim's clothing items were inside this bag. Police now have proof that they have tracked down two of the three kidnappers, and they are hot on the trail of one of them. Another call comes in. David's performance on the phone has been effective. The kidnappers agree to bring Selena to the drop-off point. Rendezvous is set within the hour. Now, police are hoping to rescue Selena. The driver of the green car leads police to a house where he meets up with the other man. The kidnappers are observed putting a big duffel bag in the trunk of one of the cars. But police can't be sure which one. 
Detective Black is on the move now. He's hooked up to the surveillance team and the Fong house. A call comes in to David Fong. The kidnappers put Selena on the phone. She appeared to be weak, uh, weaker in voice, weaker in character. It was quite apparent that she was not being treated well and that she was losing her will. Police realize that Selena is in one of the cars they are trailing. The question is, which one? Based on cell phone triangulation, they target the blue car. We instructed that the takedown of the first vehicle happen. The Fongs listen live to the takedown via a radio hookup. All three radio channels broke out in chaos. Most of the officers converged on the one car that they believed the victim was in. The victim wasn't in the vehicle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Detective Black wonders, has he just signed Selena's death warrant by revealing the police involvement? Let's go! But Detective Flewelling is still following the second car. was pumping so hard and was screaming at him, police, you know, put your hands up, put your hands up. And I put him on the ground and I went down on top of him. And I was telling him that you're under arrest for kidnapping. Do you understand? And it was at that point that he said, she's in the trunk. Flewelling's partner sees a duffel bag, but it's not moving. tell that she'd been through an ordeal. She looked very scared. But when I approached her and said, I'm a police officer, everything's OK, you could see the relief in her face that it was finally over. We ran the gamut of frustration, anger, tears, and ultimate joy that we as a group were able to rescue this young woman. And there isn't any one of us that will forget our involvement in this investigation for as long as we live. But one shadow remains for the police. This was too well orchestrated, too well planned, too well carried out. We believe that somewhere out there is a level higher than these people, perhaps dealing with organized crime, perhaps connected to gang activity. Police charge Gary Chong and Chi Wai Chan with kidnapping. Each is sentenced to 14 years in prison. They never revealed the identity of the third man. The leader of their triad is still out there. 